Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. Joining me today is David Kopel, Associate Policy Analyst at the Cato Institute, Research Director at the Independence Institute, and Adjunct Professor of Advanced Constitutional Law at University of Denver Sturm College of Law, which is my alma mater, and he was my professor. Welcome to Free Thoughts, David. Thank you very much. You've done quite well post-law school. Well, thank you. And you got me into firearms to begin with when I was your research assistant. I didn't really, wasn't terribly interested in firearms. I was a libertarian, but I, I don't own guns. I'm not big into guns myself, but it's a very interesting topic. And of course, it's much in the in the news over the last year with mass shootings. So are there more mass shootings than ever before? Um, if you're t- talking about what the public commonly calls mass shootings, these horrific crimes like in uh, Las Vegas or Sutherland Springs, Texas, um, there are several per year. And so looking at a trend is a little difficult, but pr- the answer is probably yes compared to, say, 20 years ago. And the, but these would be – there's mass shootings, which the FBI can call four or more in a single – incident or a single act versus spree killings, which is different. So sometimes those numbers are misleading if you hear them from like Mother Jones or something. Well, and, and the, the gun ban activists have sort of their own idiosyncratic definition of mass shootings, for which there is no formal of the official definition. So they would call a lot of ordinary gun crime a mass shooting. Like, let's say there's a liquor store robbery and the the robber shoots two people who work at the store and two patrons. And, and so four people are, are injured. Nobody's killed. They would call that a mass shooting. That's, I, I think, in the fits in the broad category of, of overall general gun crime. That overall general gun crime uh, is down massively uh, compared to the early 1990s. The uh, gun homicide rate uh, has fallen by over half, and the uh, gun violence victimization rate is down by about 70 percent over the past 25 years. So there's been a tremendous amount of progress in reducing uh, gun crime in the United States. Now, you said something interesting there. You said gun ban advocates, and I, I imagine people listening to this who who aren't very totally friendly to gun rights might think that that was a little bit overstating your case. Uh, there are people who want gun control. Is it fair to call them gun ban advocates? Oh, it, it depends. Uh, I, I think it's fair to call Michael Bloomberg a gun ban advocate, and he's the uh, sugar daddy of what is the 900-pound gorilla of the anti-gun movement in this country. I mean, it, it's taken over the issue from all of the uh, traditional groups, which had uh, you know more of a somewhat more of, of a base, but, you know, they've, they've got their one fund here, and, and he's, he's got lots of billionaire friends. Uh, Bloomberg uh, filed a brief in the U.S. Supreme Court in the Heller case uh, saying that Second Amendment, individual Americans have no Second Amendment rights at all. He, uh, as mayor of New York City, used registration lists to confiscate guns. He's said over and over that, like, people who own guns are, like you said, if you own a gun uh, and you have children in your home, you're stupid. Uh, and he has, at every opportunity, uh, endorsed all kinds of uh, ban legislation. Now, in terms of the sort of makeup of the gun control side, uh, I think a lot of them you know, think rifles are okay and shotguns are okay. They might want to ban other things, but but some of them might be of the sort that they think that a good just society would have no guns in private hands. Do you, do you, what do you think the makeup is on that in terms of the – when you interact with gun control advocates, do you think a lot of them are actually just hiding the fact that they would rather ban guns entirely? I think one, one data point was I uh, talked to a guy who – had been very closely involved in what's now, what's now called the Brady campaign. Before that, it was called Handgun Control Incorporated. Before that, it was the uh, National Coalition to Control Handguns. And, you know, that organization, when it started out in the 1970s, was very expressly for a handgun ban. And it would also say long guns are not the problem. The book written by their then president said that point. We, you know, well, we got no interest in that issue. Obviously, that changed, and so much so that, as this guy explained, he wanted the group to run an ad showing some hunter guy, you know, out in the field carrying a shotgun, you know, about bird hunting or something like like that, looking very wholesome. Uh, and the ad would say, "This guy is not the problem," <laughs> which uh, I would agree with. Uh, and the. Brady campaign by that point was so anti-gun in its ethos that they they couldn't bring themselves even to do that. 
Interesting. Back to get to back to mass shootings. Um, we described how it wasn't a large portion of the homicide, and the homicide rate is going down. But but if they have these spree killings have kind of increased, and it's hard to say a trend, but if they these are getting a little bit upsetting, people are starting to look at their phone and say, "Not again." Right. Um, I certainly feel that way. Is well, absolutely. But is it? I mean, no one's championing it, but is it a little bit ridiculous? The rest of the world looks at us and says, "You know, we did something about this." In, in Dunblane, Scotland, there was a mass killing, and they and they went after guns. In Port Arthur, Australia, they there was a mass shooting, and they did something about it. And just consistently, we don't do anything about this. We, people are just saying, "Oh, another SSDD, another mass shooting." Is that is that okay for us to react so sort of nonchalantly to these horrible acts of violence? Well, I don't think it's a nonchalant reaction at all. I think it's a very People are very concerned and they, they think seriously about what can be done. But when you have advocates who say, oh, you know, when they uh, – what the United Kingdom did or what Australia did, they confiscated guns. They used – they had guns on registration lists and then they did massive confiscation. In Australia, they confiscated – 20 or 25 percent of the total gun supply, and then they did future rounds of confiscation for more guns. So when you have Americans like Hillary Clinton or lots of others who say, oh, look at Australia, they show the right way to go. Well, yeah, they're telling you they are gun banners. They're not only – they don't want to only ban future sales. They want to confiscate guns from existing people. Now, if you tried an Australia – style gun confiscation in the United States, you'd be confiscating about 60 million guns. That is unrealistic. It is, in fact, dangerous to law enforcement to force them to do something like that. And it would make all the problems we've had in the past of things when you try to prohibit things against uh, the, the uh, popular will, uh, alcohol prohibition, uh, the war on marijuana users, all those things, those would be small scale uh, compared to the social trouble we would get by trying to follow that UK or Australia gun ban system. And by the way, on a per capita basis, uh, lots of countries have more mass shootings uh, than the and fatalities uh, than the United States. And of course, there's also this thing where only only some things count as a mass shooting. So if you know the narco traficantes in Mexico uh, murder twelve people, that doesn't count for I suppose for two reasons. One is uh, some people don't count uh, killings by organized criminals as a mass shooting, and secondly, there's this kind of bigoted view that the only comparables for the United States are like the West or Western Europe and Japan. And you can't ever think about other countries like our neighbor to the south, which has incredibly repressive gun laws and a much more serious uh, uh, firearms crime problem uh, than the United States. And that that's true broadly. The United States has a lower homicide rate uh, than the world average. Now, if we look at the, the tools of mass shooters, though, and we see for example, in Las Vegas, the, the amount of guns he had there, the, the, he uses a thing called a bump stock, which I'll ask you more about in a second to make rapid fire faster. But it's just a bunch of weapons of war that he, you know, we, I, a lot of stuff has to come out about where he purchases and how. But, you know, couldn't we at least say, hey, you know, you shouldn't be able to buy five assault weapons at a time. That probably indicates something about what you might be doing. I mean, it might make a marginal effect, but isn't that something we should be doing? Well, you can look at our – we have a comparable law on this, which is uh, since 1968, um, anytime somebody buys two or more handguns in a in, – within a – week, uh, local law enforcement and the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives get notified of that purchase. And that's sure moved a lot of paperwork around. But I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find anybody who'd say that has helped us uh, prevent crimes or or do anything. You know, it's, yes, if you're like a gun collector, you know, you go to the gun collector show that weekend and maybe, you, you know, you might buy seven guns, handguns then. Uh, that doesn't mean you're going to use them for nefarious purposes. Um, so if, if the system isn't really producing much of value on handguns, it's hard to see why extending it to long guns would, would have benefits. Well, assault weapons are used in most of these mass shootings, correct? Um, assault weapons is, is a bogus term invented by the gun ban lobbies and has no meaningful standard definition. I can tell you what an assault rifle is, uh, as defined by the United States government's Defense Intelligence Agency. An assault rifle is something that is... Uh, of, of the type that was invented by the uh, the German 
military and started to be used in 1943. Um, and similar, the uh, of Kalashnikov, uh, Avtomat Kalashnikov rifle, AK-47, Avtomat Kalashnikov 1947 rifle uh, is that is one of those. And that is a uh, medium sized rifle that can fire either one shot at a time, semi-automatically, or it can fire automatically like a machine gun. That's what a, a genuine assault rifle is. Uh, militaries all over the world use assault rifles. The guns that are falsely labeled as so-called assault weapons in the United States are not that. You won't find one of them that is used by any military anywhere in the world. These are normal guns that fire one shot at a time, and they get demonized um, because they can be. As the as a strategy memo written by uh, Josh Sugarman, one of the leading thinkers of gun prohibition, uh, wrote in 1987, uh, the public would be confused because they would, when we talk about these assault weapons, as he calls them, the public will say, oh, it looks like a machine gun, so it must be a machine gun. And that confusion has persisted uh, ever since, the, the disinformation against normal guns that because they have, for example, their stock is made of black polymer rather than, than brown walnut, uh, that it's supposedly a military gun. Well, that seems, I mean, a little bit nitpicky. If you look at the pictures of the arsenal in Las Vegas or the pictures of these guns used in, you know, used in a lot of these crimes, they're not squirrel rifles. They're not hunting rifles. They're not shotguns. They're, they're, they look like what our military carry. I mean, like, why are pe normal people allowed to even own that? They certainly are hunting rifles. Uh, they are, uh, the most common caliber is two two three, which is not powerful enough uh, for uh, game larger than a deer, but they are quite commonly used uh, for hunting, for target shooting, for very high-end uh, target competitions, um, and for home defense. Because in that caliber of two two three, which is relatively small, lightweight, relatively less recoil, easier to control, uh, especially people uh, who maybe don't have that much upper body strength, uh, find them to be a, a good rifle for home defense. They're, they're very versatile. So you mentioned machine guns and, and the machine gun fully automatic function of an assault rifle. Um, since you seem, you know, to, to sort of say these these aren't unique, but so would machine guns, should we make those legal? Well, First of all, what is the legal status of machine guns for listeners who don't know? Machine guns were invented in 1884. Well, I take the automatic uh, automatics were invented in 1884. The uh, machine gun, if you want to be really technical, has a different definition because that would go back to Gatling guns and, and predecessors like that. But what federal law is concerned about is is an automatic uh, where you press by pressing the trigger once, that's all you have to do, and ammunition will fire continuously. That was invented in again in 1884. By it's by federal law, it's called a machine gun, which is not exactly correct, but uh, that's how it, it is. is. What it is. <laughs> it is what it is. So in 1934, um, and, and machine guns, having been invented, were extremely expensive. And, you know, obviously they're they're not only expensive for them in themselves, they also the, the amount of ammunition you use is, is real expensive. So they never really caught on with the, the general public. Obviously, they, they had military utility, you know, in a very horrific way, for example, in, in the trench warfare of World War I. Um, and even when the, the Thompson submachine gun was invented, and that was brought to the market in the 1920s. As, the, Al, the Al Capone gun. Exactly. Well, it, it, it never really caught on with the, the general public. I mean, some, some people got it, but, but it was much more popular with gangsters uh, than with, with regular folks. And so in 1934, Congress enacted a tax and registration system for uh, automatics, uh, what it calls machine guns. And that has been in place ever since. In 1986, as uh, part of as an amendment to the Firearms Owners Protection Act, which was a comprehensive revision of federal gun laws, uh, the s manufacture of new machine guns for non-government people uh, was prohibited after May 19th, 1986. So today, in, in 37 states, you can, under state law in conjunction with federal law, you can lawfully own a machine gun, but it'll be one that was made before May 19th, 1986. And it's, it's, you'll not only pay the $200 federal tax on it, you'll, it'll take 
months to go through the paperwork uh, to do it. And obviously, the, the gun itself is probably you know six thousand dollars or or more in so, price. So if that so that so it's hard to get a machine gun. You can go to gun ranges and shoot them if they because they pay a lot to shoot them and things like this. Right. And it would be bad though. Correct me if I'm wrong. That if these mass shooters had machine guns. Um, and we don't have any machine guns in society, and we were able to get rid of them over a long period of time or make them very difficult to attain. I mean, it, it, and so if the Aurora shooter had a machine gun, that would have been worse, I think. Uh, and we're both from Colorado, so the, yeah. you know, call them by. So, so, yeah. so why why don't we do that with all guns? Why why don't we go? I mean, we, it'll take a long time. There are three hundred million guns. Why don't we start with the National Firearms Act, with the tax, with the transfer, with the registry, move into thing, make them so they're very rare, and then and then make a dent in this problem for for guns in general. You're yeah, talking like about for, for particularly dangerous guns. Well, guns are dangerous. You know, they're they, they ain't toys, um, and you know, even a single shot twenty two caliber gun can can kill somebody. Um, so it's as, as a uh, NRA certified safety instructor, it's important. But you'd rather have a single shot twenty two if that was all a mass shooter had available to him. Yes. So the trade-off is what Congress decided with machine guns was, well, on the one hand, you know, we see them used in things like the St. Valentine's Day massacre and by gangsters. And on the other hand, we don't really see a lot of law-abiding folks, you know, having fun with them at the target range or, or you know, using them for protection or, or whatever. So that, that trade-off was fairly easy. Now, I should point out there are tens of thousands or more machine gun hobbyists who enjoy their their hobby and comply with the National Firearms Act and you know have have fun at a target range with it and and don't cause anybody any problems and in fact none of the you know it's it's almost never our gun the machine guns that have been lawfully possessed pursuant to the National Firearms Act, they they have essentially no involvement um, in crime. You do sometimes have stolen machine guns, like from a military armory or things like that, that, that might be used by, say, a, a drug gang. Um, firearms save lives when they're in the right hands. And firearms in the wrong hands are very dangerous to the general public. So sensible gun laws recognize both sides. And this, this is what the... Uh, the way the gun ban movement is really sort of a flat earth society um, in terms of the empirical facts about guns is they just insist that, you know, as uh, Shannon Watts, the head of Michael Bloomberg's uh, Moms Demand Group, uh, says that uh, a good guy with a gun never stops a crime, which is crazy because you can read about it in the newspapers every day. Maybe not every newspaper, every single newspaper, every issue of every newspaper around the country, but if you certainly follow national news, that it happens frequently. And of course, Stephen Williford uh, saved dozens of lives with his AR-15 in the, uh, the Sutherland Springs crime. But more generally, uh, firearms are used according to social science, uh, including uh, recent reports by the uh, or a report a few years ago by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which did a summary of the issue. And it said, you know, we don't really know. And there, there's a there's a range of estimates. But the the low end would put defensive gun uses in this country at tens of thousands per year. The higher end of the estimate would we'd get into well over a million. Um, and you can – some people like the National Opinion Research Center, when it looked into it, said, well, really probably the, the, the correct answer we think is probably somewhere in between. So it said uh, hundreds of thousands of defensive gun uses annually in this country. Now, most of them without a shot being fired. Uh, usually the display of the gun is a sufficient deterrent for the criminal to decide it's time to leave work early that day, and that ends the situation. So you have you have really huge contributions to public safety by guns in the right hands. And I've I've talked to plenty of people who tell me how their lives were saved because they had a gun um, at the right time. And others who's you know they would have been raped or assaulted, or or otherwise really horribly victimized, uh, but they would save themselves because they had because they had a gun. In fact, you know, uh, Cato's uh, former former Cato guy, Tom Palmer, uh, who was one of the plaintiffs in the case that eventually became District of Columbia versus Heller, uh, was with a friend uh, who was in California. The, the friend was gay and a bunch of 
thugs came up to them intending to do some gay bashing. And Palmer had his handgun, showed it, and that was the end of the gay bashing. And all the gay bashers decided it was time to go, uh, you know, walk, watch Clockwork Orange again or something else. <laughs> now, when it comes to the, this level of defensive gun use, as we call it, it isn't it the case that I mean, these these crimes are being committed because people have guns and the criminals have guns. And so saying that the solution to this is to pour more guns into the situation and to let people defend themselves with guns as opposed to go back and try to take the guns away from the criminals, that that seems to be more sensible than just pouring, thing on, pouring more gasoline on the fire. Well, you can do both. And putting a, guns in law-abiding hands aren't gasoline on the fire. They're, how you, they're fire extinguishers uh, in, in that regard. You know, I mean, I agree. There, there are people who think that, that guns cause crime, that, uh, you know, this is a common trope of, of the gun ban movement, that uh, if you have a gun in the house and you're a normal person, that you are at risk of flying into some rage. You know, you're, you, you were happily married for 30 years and then, you know, then you got a gun and then one day your wife burned the chicken dinner and, and you shoot her. Because uh, guns cause people – I mean they literally say things like this, that the guns cause people to, to go crazy or to lose self-control. Um, again, that's the opposite of what the social science says. People who use guns uh, for crimes uh, are not people who were law-abiding and then turned into a criminal. They were criminals beforehand. Now, guns can certainly facilitate a crime. It, it depends on the situation. You know, O.J. Simpson uh, didn't need a gun to murder his – ex-wife because he's a he's a big, strong guy. On the other hand, say a scrawny 14-year-old probably couldn't hold up a liquor store or a convenience store uh, if he only had a knife, or at least it would be it would be harder for that criminal to do so. So certainly there, there are times when a, a gun... Okay, that more than facilitate, that can actually cause it. I mean, there might be someone who, who, who says, I wouldn't rob except for a gun. I mean, right. I mean, like, if yes. you gave me a knife, I wouldn't rob. But if you gave me a gun, I would rob. That that's right. That might that might. He's criminal in his mind already, but he doesn't see an opportunity unless he unless he has the the firearm. Because, you know, this this is the thing about guns: is everything that makes them usable for and and superior to other arms for self defense also makes them usable for offense, particularly the ability to project force at a distance and as something that, that equalizes uh, the disparity between people of different strengths or, or numbers. So, you know, a, a woman in a parking garage uh, who's, say, 50 years old and surrounded by four thugs, a handgun's the only thing as a practical matter, that's going to equalize uh, that disparity in force between them. So, by the way, if you get rid of all guns, then the, the, the that's a great deal for the four thugs because they uh, you can go back to the rule of the strong like we had in the Middle Ages, and whoever's the biggest and toughest and meanest uh, will be able to dominate everybody else. So that would uh, – women and elderly and, and other people uh, who aren't big and tough uh, will be the ones victimized probably more in that scenario. But ultimately, it would be better – even if there was the same level of crime with let's push a button and make guns disappear from everyone, victims, criminals, even the government, and then and then say – let's say the, this, the level of crime would be the same, which I'm not sure it would be. Let's say it would be. But we've converted every gun attack into a knife attack. That would be better, correct? I mean that would be a better – it would be less lethal. Your, your hypothesis is that we keep the, the gun – the level of crime constant. I think it would increase the level of home invasion burglaries. One of the studies we – another thing that's pretty clear from the social science and this, this is presented in my uh, Supreme Court amicus brief for a large coalition of law enforcement organizations in the, the Heller case was study after study after study of both burglars who were in prison and even one study that managed to interview uh, burglars in St. Louis who were out of prison and were active, successful professional burglars, is the biggest part of their working day is observing the place they're targeting and trying really hard to make sure that there's nobody home when they go in. Because if they do, there is a high risk of getting shot. 
that is a the a burglar's risk of getting shot is about equal to a burglar's risk of going to jail, so we're going to prison. If you figure one is a deterrent, then probably the other um, equal equally sized risk is is also a deterrent. The Centers for Disease Control in the nineteen uh, mid nineteen fifties, and they're they're not known as one of the the top uh, pro gun organizations out there. Uh, did a national study that estimated uh, guns are used defensively against burglars in the United States about six hundred thousand times a year. And again, that's usual. The large majority of scenarios are not a shot being fired. It's just the display of the gun, the distinctive sound of a pump action shotgun being racked to load the round uh, makes the burglar, burglar decide to leave the scene. You can contrast that with what goes on in Australia after they did their ban on defensive gun ownership and England and the Netherlands and Ireland and lots and lots of other places where burglars come into deliberately come into occupied homes and do so with impunity. And they do so because uh, the occupied home is better for the burglar because you've got purses and wallets at home where you can take cash, which has uh, – you don't have to sell at a discount uh, the way you do with, with other goods that you're, you're fencing on the black market. And we know that a – not the majority, but a significant minority of home invasion burglaries when the occupants are present uh, leads to uh, assault against the occupants. So when you increase home invasion burglaries, when you, if you keep the number of burglaries constant, but you move, move more of them to becoming home invasions, you will be significantly raising uh, the assault rate in the United States. Well, you can defend yourself with other things too. I mean, then my hypothetical taking guns away, uh, you can defend yourself with. You can have home security. You can have a machete. You can have a big <laughs> dog. I mean, so yeah, yeah shouldn't right. we shouldn't we be comparing guns to like big dogs? I mean, I mean, other th forms of security. If we made all guns disappear, so now the criminals just have knives, but we have big. Do I mean, I'm, other ways of protecting uh, you ourselves. Know, I've, I've had a big dog, and. Um, she would certainly leap up to joyfully greet uh, the burglar. Uh, but the bars in her window. Though. Well, I, I didn't train. I didn't train my big dog. My big dog to be a man killing machine. You know, you can train dogs to do that. That they will. Yes, when you say attack, they will go at it and they'll they'll do something. They have, uh, have very good genetic skills to do, which is, is rip somebody's throat out and and try to kill them. Um, now. You tell me that we're going to be safer uh, when instead of the gun, which sits in its safe or the bedside drawer, completely inert and has no will of its own and will never get up and walk around and attack somebody on its own. We want to have pe people saying, well, instead of a gun for defense, you should have dogs that are trained to attack and kill strangers. Uh, I don't th I th you know. Well, I mean, there's a variety of home security options available. I take your point on dogs, but you um, you can get a security system, right? You can you can. Oh, yeah, which, you, can, you can get a security system and the security system will when the burglar comes in. Uh, automatically notify somebody in Northfield, Minnesota or someplace, and then the people in Northfield, Minnesota will call the police, and then the police will send somebody with a gun to the trained, scene. But a trained person. People who you can you can do training on your own. But isn't it really hard for an individual person to actually uh, like use a gun defense? I mean, they're going to freak out. The guns will be taken from them by the criminal and used again. I mean, cops go through a police academy, basically – Almost military style training, and and or normal normal person with a gun does not go through that. So I mean, I've heard that criminals are more likely to take a gun from someone and use it against them if you right. use a defensive well, gun. Well, if, if you're still hearing that, you should distrust whoever you're hearing it from because Gary Kleck, a uh, professor at Florida State uh, University School of Criminology, uh, his his book on gun data, uh, point blank won the. Uh, American Society of Criminology's award for the the best work of crim, best criminology book in a three year period, and Kleck studied the the data on that, which comes mainly from the National Crime Victimization uh, Survey, which conducted by the Census Bureau and, and the Department of Justice, and they found uh, the, the data showed the takeaways are extremely rare, well well under one percent of defensive gun uses, and in, in fact. Uh, Takeaways from the criminal actually happen more often than than takeaways from from the defender. Um, no, they, they, but they, you, of course, you're right. Like, yeah, I represent law enforcement all the time in the courts, and of course, law enforcement on the whole is better trained in firearms than the average citizen. So, you know, you can look at that when the uh, 
guy from Wisconsin tried to murder uh, the Republicans at baseball practice uh, this summer. The heroic D.C. Capitol Police officer, I mean, she she got she shot the criminal at a pretty long range with a handgun. That was a very impressive shot. She was she was really good and, and presumably well trained. And I would bet it wouldn't surprise me if she was one of those officers who, besides doing the mandatory training, spends a lot of optional time um, in, in skills practice. Uh, for a home invasion, you're not in that kind of complicated or difficult shot scenario. You know, the vast majority of defensive gun uses uh, are at a distance of 10 feet or less. So and you're also not in a situation where, well, OK, a police officer going into, say, a home he's never been into before where there's a domestic violence call to 911. He goes in. He doesn't know who's there, who are the, who's the good guy, who's the bad guy, you know, how, how those alliances might shift. That's a very complicated situation for which it, it's really important to have a lot of good training, and, and not just with the firearm side of that. Uh, but in contrast, when you're defending a, yourself against uh, two guys who just kicked down your front door, uh, it, it's fairly clear who the good guys are and who the bad guys are and uh, of the necessity for the immediate use of defensive force. But if you have a gun in your house, we, we were talking about the dog analogy, but if you have a gun in your house and most guns are not going to be used defensively, I would I would imagine. I've never used my uh, fire extinguisher defensively either. Well, I have but, fire extinguishers all over the house and the house is never caught on fire. But isn't, the, isn't having a gun in the house, knowing that, even just more dangerous because of accidents, because of its ability to be taken by your children? I mean, we hear all the time that it is more likely to hurt someone you love or you or be used in a suicide or something than to stop a crime. Well, it depends on how the gun is stored. You know, if, if you uh, happen to live in a home with a uh, violent alcoholic who's got a criminal record, uh, then probably bringing a gun into the house and leaving it accessible to that guy uh, may well be raising uh, the, the risks. Um, you know, on the other hand, if you leave that guy and move out on your own and get a gun in your own home, in case he comes over and decides he wants to kill you now that you've left, uh, you're much safer having that, that firearm for defense. Uh, the issue of children and accidents is something that has been very successfully addressed by education and uh, safe storage practices, which definitely vary from family to family based on the circumstances. You know, the number of uh, fatal gun accidents in this country uh, per capita since the early 1970s, it's fallen by 88% overall. And for children, that is ages 0 to 14, it's fallen by 92%. And that's come at a time when we've just about doubled the number of guns in this country. So rising gun ownership, more exposure to guns, as they say in the literature, uh, has been consistent with dramatically falling accident rates. But we've also, we also have pretty concentrated Gun ownership. I mean, if we doubled the gun ownership and also because most people own multiple guns, correct? It's less than half the households in America own guns. Uh, mm, or about, pretty, half. about yeah, it depends on the surveys, and it also depends on you know, it, as you said, on households. If if dad owns four guns, then is is mom a gun owner too? You know, if she has access to them and uses them sometimes, you know, maybe. So when you're trying to count gun gun owners, that's that's a complexity. But the d depending on the surveys, you get about a third to a half of American households owning guns, and of course there are probably that that may be an underestimate so that, since there are plenty of gun owners who are not really interested in, in self-disclosing to a stranger on the telephone. So we have so we have a gun gun deaths. Uh, we have violence in America. It doesn't look like it does in Western Europe. Uh, there are a lot of guns here. Uh, there are fewer guns in other countries. And everyone keeps saying the gun, you know, people people on the gun rights side keep saying guns are not the problem when that seems to be the obvious the obvious difference here. Well, between, well sure. sure between, yeah, you're right. It's not like Western Europe and thank God. And that's one of the reasons it's not is because we have guns in this country. Well, why is it? Why are we, no, more, no, are we more violent here? No, we're, we're over the law, over the historical term, we're considerably less violent. Try being a Jewish guy walking around Paris, Berlin with a yarmulke. 
try being a woman wearing a short skirt uh, in Gothenburg, Scotland. I was sorry, Gothenburg, Sweden. There are a rising amount of gang impunity, groups of thugs uh, who go around freely attacking Jews, women, and others in Western Europe. And the governments of Western Europe tell you, oh, well, you can't have a gun to protect yourself in that kind of situation. And by the way, if you criticize the people who are doing this, uh, then we'll persecute you for hate speech or, you know, because uh, you're supposedly prejudiced because uh, you don't like uh, gangs of immigrant criminals uh, beating people up or sometimes not immigrants, uh, sometimes children of uh, previous immigrants. And the let's look at the last 70 years of homicide in Western Europe because they had gun control stemming from their historic distrust of the people, which is why this country was founded on different principles. Because they had gun control, for example, when the Nazis came into France and Belgium and took it over, uh, they were able to confiscate all the weapons because they had there were registration lists of guns. And so the Nazis vacuumed up everything they could. In Eastern Europe, after uh, Operation Barbarossa started on June 22, 1941, and Germany invaded uh, eastern Poland, the Baltic states, Ukraine, uh, Belarus, all of which were at the time puppet colonies of Stalin. And then, of course, they went into Russia itself. In that first year, a million people died in mass shootings. The Germans sent around the Einsatzgruppen, just a few thousand specially trained killers, to go from small town to small town and one town at a time, march the Jews and the gypsies, also known as the Roma, march the Jews and the, then the Roma out of town, line them up, shoot them all, move on to the next town. So we had a million people killed at mass shootings in Europe. In this, Seems like a really strange definition of mass shooting. Well, when you kill it, when you're shooting a bunch of people all at once, I'd call that a mass shooting. This wasn't war. This wasn't warfare. This this was not, uh, you know, the Soviet tanks against the Russian tanks against the German tanks. When you have uh, twelve people who use guns to murder three hundred people, I'll call that a mass shooting. But it's the government. I mean, it's the Nazi. Oh, yeah. I mean, it seems like you, it's, it, to use a black swan event in world history, like the Nazi Germany, which is arguably the craziest thing that has ever happened in the history of the world. Uh, that seems kind of a strange justification. Well, for, it, okay. First of all, genocide isn't a black swan event in this world. Uh, you, uh, it happened in Rwanda with machetes uh, under the Bill Clinton administration. It uh, sort of the. the uh, Foundational genocide for the 20th century was what the Turks uh, did to the Armenians during World War I. And by the way, the, as uh, I've written for National Review Online, among others, to the extent that Ar Armenians in that situation were able to get guns for defense, they significantly saved lives. And so did the Jews uh, under in Pol in eastern Poland, where it's more marshy and forested, in France in the resistance. To the extent that Jews were able to get, the, get a hold of guns, they were able to save a significant amount of lives. And genocide certainly didn't end when Hitler died. Uh, it's continued under communist regimes uh, globally. Um, I'm not sure what Robert Mugabe did in uh, Zimbabwe counts as genocide, but it certainly counts as mass murder. Professor R.J. Rummel of the University of Hawaii did a book in the early 1990s um, estimating the numbers of, of deaths by government in this past century. And this was just up, just up to the early 90s. And he wasn't counting warfare, and nor was he counting warfare in which instead of the soldiers being killed, you know, maybe you're bombing a town because there's a military base there, but you, know, you kill a lot of civilians too. He wasn't counting those. He was only counting the intentional murders uh, by governments. And it's about 100 million, perhaps more, over the course of the century. So mass murder by government has never been more common than it has been in the last century. Well, it seems to make sense to have a different theory of like gun, different theory of gun ownership 
that varies based on the quality of your government. I mean, that would that would I think even gun control advocates would say, yes, if you live in a very dangerous place and you have a very dangerous government, I am all for gun ownership. But if you have a stable Western democracy where you can call the police and you don't have to resort to your own sort of self help methods, it's a very different question. Well, but it, it's an it's an arrogant historically <laughs> thing to assume that because your government's pretty nice at one time that it's going to be so great in the future. Germany in 1900 was one of the most tolerant countries in the world for Jews. It had a well-functioning democracy and a free press. And so did you need guns to resist the government in Germany in 1930? Absolutely not. Well, but by the time you did, when Hitler took over in 1933, it was a little late to say, oh, well, Mr. Hitler, now that you're, you know, a uh, Jew-hating fanatic and setting up a totalitarian dictatorship. At this point, we think we'd like to apply for some permits to own guns. It, it, it's too late at that point. And if the guns are registered, you can bet that the germ, the government will vacuum them up from anybody who's with the slightest suspicion of, of being a, a free thinker or not subservient to the totalitarian boot. And it was the uh, the German gov the Nazi government actually didn't even need to change its gun laws uh, until 1938. They found the, the Weimar Republic's gun registration and licensing laws uh, were quite sufficient to take guns away from the Jews, the socialists, uh, people who believed in democracy, and limit gun ownership uh, solely to uh, people who were trusted to be subservient tools of the, the party. So we have a gun violence problem in America. We have mass shootings, which might be going up in you know, one could happen between when this episode comes out and, and like I said, a lot of people just be like, well, it's another one. Um, are we just saying throw your hands up in the air and there's nothing we can do about this? Like we can't make people wait or even try something out, you know, a waiting period or or, or extended background checks or better background, better sharing of information. I mean, mental health. I mean, you know, are we just saying that there's nothing we can do to like stop these people from getting guns and we just have to say, well, that's how America works. No, there are lots of things we can do and we should be doing them and we should and we might have started doing them sooner uh, if so much of the political uh, air supply wasn't being sucked up by the gun ban lobby, uh, which is something that gets a lot of a political attention and a lot of media attention and distracts from things that are a lot more boring. For example, uh, talking in D.C. or probably anywhere in this country about the level of funding for probation and parole services and what a how many cases an average probation or parole officer has to work. And then if they do want to revoke parole for somebody for bad behavior, is there the jail capacity to take them or do they have to keep saying, well, it's too bad you did that and you really should get revoked, but there's no room at the jail, which is at 137 percent of capacity already. So uh, we're not going to do anything about that. Secondly, in terms of mass shootings, not all, but a very large number of mass shooters have severe mental health problems. In, in fact, the mass shootings issue is sort of detracts from the much larger issue of, of homicide in general. About a fifth of people in state prisons uh, for homicide convictions have serious mental health problems. And people who have mental health problems in this country often don't get the help they need. Now, one one thing is important to say, there are studies that go back and forth about whether people with mental illness, broadly defined, are more likely to, be, to commit crimes or not. And there there's a lot of good evidence that, that comes down somewhat on, on the, the not side. But even the people who would advocate for that would say, yes, that is true in general. But at an extreme end, when you've got serious schizophrenia, there really is a much increased risk for homicide. Now, most people with serious schizophrenia don't don't commit homicide, not even close. In fact, the, the biggest crime problem related to mental health is people with mental illness are much more likely to be victimized uh, by crime. So when you're helping uh, people with, with mental illnesses, you're really preventing crime in a lot of ways, not just because not necessarily the person's dangerous, but they might be able to uh, be more situationally aware and so so not get victimized. But at, at the at the mass shooting level, you've, you've got a lot of 
mental illness. This country now has the same number of mental health treatment beds per capita as we did in 1850. This is a terrible shortage. And it's one of the things the government should be spending more on and be more active in, in providing this kind of social safety net. One of my friends from uh, grade school later developed uh, Carolyn Dobbins. She wrote a book, uh, uh, What a Life Can Be. Uh, she got severe schizoaffective disorder. And she's, you know, she's doing fine. And she's actually a, she's got a degree in psychology and is a practicing psychologist, but she's had things in her life where she said, you know, I, I know I'm going downhill. I'm decompressing uh, in the, as the official term. I'm not psychotic yet, but I've been there before and I know I'm on the way. And she walks into a mental health facility and they say, sorry, you know, you're not crazy enough yet. You know, come back in a few days. Well, Carolyn's a very nonviolent person who would never hurt anyone. So it was getting turned away like that was was bad for her, but it didn't create any risk of crime to society. But in there's there's other cases where it can. And if we were more proactive in, in helping people who want treatment, that would be a tremendous change we could make in this country uh, to increase safety both for the people who need the treatment and for everyone else. But in terms of banning something like – we're going to talk about some of the, the the tools of mass shooters, bump stocks. Is that, a, is that OK to ban a bump stock? Well, I just testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee this morning and said that something that makes a normal gun fire as fast as a machine gun should be regulated like a machine gun. And I don't think that would violate the the Second Amendment, at least as construed by the Supreme Court in the Heller case, which more or less said machine guns aren't part of the Second Amendment right. Um, you know, bump stocks are sort of novelty gimmicks that have been used by guys who just want to go to the shooting range and have fun shooting off a bunch of rounds fast. And, you know, it's kind of an expensive waste of ammo in, in my uh, thrifty uh, view of things. But it's a harmless activity. And the Las Vegas crime was the first time that a bump stock was ever used in a crime, as far as I know. But the potential is now there. And we know that, that mass killers tend to study each other's techniques carefully and copy them. So I think it would be legitimate to regulate uh, bump stocks at the, at the same level. As machine guns, which means it's something you can, you can possess, but there's a, you know, this month long federal registration and, and tax process uh, to go through. You you got to submit fingerprints. It, it it's a it, it it's a big thing, and so yeah, that and on the other hand, bump stocks don't have defensive utility. Um, they degrade the accuracy of a firearm, which would make it less suitable for self-defense. And certainly, I don't think there's any state in the country that would, would allow hunting with that. I mean, you can't hunt with machine guns in general, so presumably you can't hunt with things that fire at the same rate as machine guns. What frustrates you most about the gun debate? Well, uh, it, it's sort of like the weather. It's uh, it, it's not the hate, it's the stupidity. <laughs> um, at least that's part of it is some in the media and and some elected officials are just so willfully ignorant of things. I mean, you, you can obviously have policy differences, but when people think that things like the Colt semi-automatic rifle that was brought to market in 1964 is a machine gun, that is just factually not true. And, you know, when people say, oh, you're more likely to have your gun taken away uh, than to be able to use it for successful self-defense, I suppose that was kind of a, a bigoted thing to say in 1962, um, but it, you know, it, it might have matched somebody's intuition and there wasn't any research on that really. But but now that there is, when, when a lot of things have been settled, it, it's disappointing to see uh, how many things that have been factually disproven keep coming back. Um, I, it's a, I, I'd say it's also disappointing to see how politically polarized uh, things have gotten. I mean, one of one of the things that the uh, Michael Bloomberg and cohorts have been very successful at doing is radicalizing the Democratic Party on this issue. Um, 
sort of like the state that it got into around 1994 when it was voting for the Clinton gun ban. Um, and then since then, after losing a bunch of elections on the gun issue, they decided, well, maybe it's it's OK for people to be moderate on this um, and, and still be members of the party. And, and now now it's gotten to be more extremist. I mean, that we, we have a problem political polarization, obviously, on, on on lots of other issues, but this is certainly one of them. In, in Congress, you know, there's lots of ways where you can do reasonable things, uh, but the problem is so often the the overreaching uh, that goes on. So, I mean, Senator Feinstein's bill doesn't just ban bump stocks. It has a very everything, uh, a provision that says anything that functions to accelerate the rate of fire of a semi-automatic firearm, which is just about all the gunsmithing work uh, you can do, like in replacing one trigger with a better trigger that operates more smoothly and therefore, you know, it, it takes uh, 1.1 second to move the trigger instead of 1.2 seconds. And what about fan like firing that. a revolver like a, like a Western? Would that be would that qualify or does that have to be some sort of technical apparatus? Well, it, it's got to be some physical thing, it, it, at least in this current draft. Yeah. It can't be just actually knowing how to shoot a gun. Guns in the right hands make the user and the public as a whole safer. Guns in the wrong hands make things more dangerous for innocent people. Sensible gun policy recognizes both of these truths, and the laws that are constitutional and appropriate are the ones that attempt to disarm dangerous people while respecting and ideally even enhancing uh, the possession and carrying of arms by law-abiding good persons. Thanks for listening. This episode of Free Thoughts was produced by Tess 